morning, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Pete. My day job is I'm a science communicator at the Genome Analysis Center in Norwich, but in my spare time, I'm madly passionate about eating insects, and in the future, farming insects. And it's mainly because I'm an ambassador for Thoughts for Food, which is where I was lucky enough to meet Max and the Agrolution Gang, who've invited me here. And I think, first of all, we can all agree that this is a very beautiful animal, right? Look at that. Way more attractive than a cow. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd start by saying where I had my first conscious insect eating experience. Like my mum assures me that when I was five, I came in with worms hanging out of my mouth and soil all over my face. Um, but this is the Payamino Reserve in Ecuador, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And um, about this time, seven years ago, we were living with a tribe in the rainforest. And we were studying insect diversity. And they thought, oh, you're studying beetles. Well, we'll bring you a tub full of these. And there arrived this big tub of pulsing beetle larvae, which they left to evacuate themselves for a couple of days. And then they cooked them up on a barbecue, and they were absolutely delicious. They tasted a bit like a combination of peanut butter and bacon, if you can imagine that, um, with so much texture. Like, genuinely delicious. Um, way better than a steak, in my humble opinion. Although, um, there was one left in the bucket, and we thought, that was so tasty, let's try another one. And then picked it up and bit into it, and it exploded, because it was definitely raw. And I've never eaten a raw tomato since, because it was the exact same sensation. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. <laughs> to digress slightly, um, we were on an insect-finding mission, and we found this really cool moth. This has nothing to do with my talk, but I was looking through the photos and thought it was great, because it looks just like Ronald McDonald. I thought that was sensational. We wanted to use that for a marketing campaign for McDonald's, but they weren't having any of it. But I thought it was quite cute. Um, so I did not let the raw bug eating experience put me off. And as part of my Thought for Food challenge idea, we wanted to promote insects to the world. So I'm more of an international insect eating connoisseur than a farmer at the moment. Um, and for some reason, my insect eating habits have been deemed strange by the media. So. They published all these stories. That's my um, locust pizza, which is dead tasty. That's um, a waxworm taco. Uh, waxworms are naturally parasitic on beehives. They taste a bit like honey and beeswax. So with, with a bit of guacamole and salsa, they're pretty delicious. Um, here's some roasted locusts. I assure you these are like gourmet. I want to promote gourmet insect food, and they're really tasty. Here's me. You can occasionally find me on TV around the world chatting about insects and feeding them to people because I'm going to explain to you why we should be eating more bugs and farming more bugs. And then there's a silly photo of me munching down on a locust. So why eat bugs? Well, for a start, they're incredibly nutritious. So there's a lot of vitamin supplements out there at the moment which are practically useless because they're not very bioaccessible. Um, and there's a lot of people who think that meat is an extremely nutritious thing, which it is. But insects are way more nutritious. They're at least equivalent in protein content as our livestock. But if you look at the vitamin content, thiamine and riboflavin, two very important um, vitamins, um, are massively higher in insects than they are in our currently farmed livestock. And there's other things, such as metal ions. So calcium deficiency and iron deficiency are two massive deficiencies, even in the Western world. And you can get probably 10 times more iron in a caterpillar than you can from the same amount of beef. So they're ridiculously nutritious. And they're also, the grubs are full of omega-3 fatty acids, which are as good weight for weight as statins at producing, uh, uh, preventing heart disease. So they're incredibly nutritious. This is a good selling point. Um, there's also these. This is an ideal situation. This is some, a couple of happy cows, possibly in Switzerland. And that's, that's all right. That's not too bad on the environment. But unfortunately, the reality around the world is this. Um, we've got 1.5 billion cattle on the planet, and there's more cow than human per mass right, on the planet at the moment. And this is what cattle farming really looks like in, say, Brazil or a lot of uh, the United States of America. Um, they don't eat grass anymore, they eat grain, right? Um, and there's massive dust bowls. Cows are the biggest cause of deforestation, desertification, acid rain worldwide. And the reason is this. Let's say this is one kilogram of grain, and this is one kilogram of cow, takes about nine kilograms of grain. Is that nine? That's nine. To feed one kilogram of beef, right? 
For pigs, they can eat food waste, but at the moment the regulations suggest we can't use food waste in a lot of regions, and they take about five kilograms of grain to get one kilogram of, of pork back. Chickens, they're a bit more sustainable, you can get about three. But crickets, the world's greatest sport, um, we're in Holland. Holland actually beat England like eight years ago in the Cricket World Cup, which is very embarrassing for a country that invented it about 400 years ago. Um, about 1.2 kilograms of matter, of green matter, to produce a kilogram of cricket. So they waste far less because the problem with livestock is this. Um, they produce a lot of this. 100,000 metric tons of poo produced each minute in the USA alone. Um, Cows also fart a lot. Um, Methane's pretty bad for the environment. Insects produce an order of magnitude less ammonia, for example, and uh, methane compared to livestock. The actual waste they produce is way, way less than livestock. The further down the food chain, it makes sense. And all this waste goes into our rivers, right? So um, we've mentioned it before with Dixon's talk, right? The waste goes into rivers, eutrophication, this starves our seas of life. This is the Gulf of Mexico, so all of the waste from the Mississippi goes into the Gulf of Mexico, which causes a 6,500 square mile dead zone, which is way more drastic than the BP oil spill, but doesn't get nearly enough press. Um, this is bad. We need a better way. Uh, this is in the water stress as well, so this is the Colorado Delta uh, in the Sea of Cortez, which is now dried up. The Colorado River does not run to the sea anymore. Um, and the water stress is ridiculous. Does anyone know where this is? This is Lake Baikal in Siberia, which is the largest freshwater lake on the planet, which contains about one-fifth of Earth's freshwater. At a conservative estimate, we use about a quarter of this lake just for our cows, which is about 5% of all the freshwater on the planet. That's a conservative estimate, and we're kind of running out of freshwater. So, what can we do? One, and I hope I want to convince you, is eat insects, because they're really tasty. Have we got some bugs to eat today? Yeah, there'll be some bugs to eat today, so we've got our friends over here who have provided us with some. Um, two, we can feed them to animals, why not? Chickens eat bugs anyway. Um, and three, you can make oil from bugs as well, so you can make very healthy cooking oil. Actually, some of the guys that came second in the Thought of Food competition have an, um, a company that extracts oil from mealworms, and you can use it instead of vegetable oil for cooking. How, though? Um, <laughs> probably not like this. So if we want to convince regulatory bodies that we can eat bugs, then we want to prove that it's clean, right? This is somewhere like Thailand, where crickets grow naturally, but eh, there's not much way of regulating how clean that environment is, so I'm giving that a big no um, for the vertical farming economy. <laughs> When I told one of my friends that I was going to a vertical farming summit, this is what she drew for me. I think she, <laughs> she slightly got the wrong end of the stick. Um, <laughs> it's quite cute, though. Um, but that's, that's not what we want, either. A circular economy. So we want to use waste to produce food, which then can give us fertilizer. That's an example. That's what insects can give us. So these are black soldier flies. And this is an example of a person who's working with them, Glenn Cortright in America. Um, there's Loads of other examples all around the world. Um, but he's kind of trying to crack this. So this is a great article which kind of explains the circular economy in a very nice way with insects. So he's basically looking at high-density farming of blackfly larvae. And he originally looked at it for generating fertilizer, but then thought, wait a minute, we've got all this protein here. Why not feed it to animals, right, instead of grain? Um, and the fact is, he's discovered, you can do this anywhere, Brooklyn to Nairobi. And in fact, here's a little map. This is just some of the insect companies around the world at the moment. Um, these guys down here on the bottom right, Kulisha, um, won Thought for Food with their idea for growing blackfly larvae to feed aquaculture farms. So you can see how this is all like interrelating already. And we've got Prote Farm with us today. I believe we've brought the bugs. Um, and here we go, circular economy. It's a low-cost operation, and you can get paid to collect food waste, right? So in a city situation, you can collect food waste from restaurants who will often pay you to get rid of it, right? And this is a point I'm going to come back to, because this is where the idea that we've got um, is going to come in. Um, approval is one big thing. If you want to introduce a new foodstuff to at least human consumption and for um, feedstuff for animals that we consume, you need to prove that they're so, uh, safe and healthy. Um, but still, you can make a profit, because pet food is fine. You can sell your insects to make pet food. And you can also package and sell the waste as fertilizer. 
So you're getting food waste in, you're growing black fly larvae, and you're getting fertilizer back, which is a pretty good circular situation. And to prove that humans can eat these things as well, this is a handy kitchen appliance. So, you know, you might have one in your kitchen sooner or later. Um, I want one. I'm saving up my pennies. So basically, you can cultivate your black fly, and then the eggs drop into here, the larvae grow. And to make them even more perfect, they harvest themselves. I don't know if you can see that, but they instinctively climb up a short tunnel and separate themselves from their waste. This is genius. That's, well, it makes it a lot easier, really, doesn't it? So <laughs> it makes perfect sense in a farming situation. Um, but here comes the point that I'm concerned about. So the problem with growing anything on scale is disease, right? We lose about 40% of our crops through pests, pathogens, and disease. Um, we, spend, we lose a billion euros worth of revenue on um, in, um, swine flu, basically, diseases of pigs. And at the moment, insect farming isn't a massive thing around the world, but when it does become a massive thing, there's going to be a lot of bugs, millions and trillions of bugs, and how are we going to keep, how are we going to know that they are um, healthy populations, and how are we going to stop disease from wiping them out and losing revenue? So I want to answer this, really, and I had an idea. By the way, you can sometimes see me on YouTube singing songs about various animals in animal costumes. Um, <laughs> I had a bright idea. I work here, this is the Genome Analysis Center, and we, amongst other things, we sequence the genomes of a range of organisms from wheat to strawberries to swine flu, um, so the metagenomes of our gut microbiota and things. Um, we're very good at analyzing DNA, and we're very good at identifying pathogens. So 13, it, well, it once took 13 years and $3 billion in international collaboration to sequence the human genome, and we can now sequence the genome of wheat in less than two weeks. So we can basically understand the essence of life incredibly easily compared to how we could do. Um, and even more importantly, there's this snazzy piece of new kit called the Minion. So our current systems of sequencing genomes are these big 500,000 pound machines uh, which can sequence a wheat genome in less than two weeks. This is a DNA sequencing machine which can fit inside your pocket. It's about this big, size of your thumb. And they're selling them for 700 pounds a piece, which is way cheaper. Um, and they're amazing because these can sequence environmental samples and they can give you a sample to computer sequence of any sample in four hours, so you can do real-time sequencing. So what I want to do is combine this with this. So in a vertical farming system, if we can have these and contain them and barcode them, and then you've got this sequencing machine, then we can directly read the health of each of these colonies as they're going through a conveyor system. And if you detect pathogens, because you can detect a whole suite of things with this machine, then we can basically hope to prove to regulatory bodies that the food we're eating is clean, which is something we can't do with the current food we eat. <laughs> I mean, the amount of fecal contaminants in uh, supermarket meat is pretty horrific, but they pass through. So I want to argue that if we can combine these high-tech solutions with vertical farming systems, then we can hope to answer this, which means we can do this, and then hopefully feed people more sustainably and more efficiently so we can grow food in cities, using food waste from cities, producing food for cities. And that's a circular economy. So, <laughs> Max asked me here as well, because um, I'm known to finish my talks with a poem as a conclusion. And then I did actually write a poem once called Bugs Have Benefits, whilst I was eating some locusts at the pub. <laughs> so I'm going to try it for you now. So it actually concludes the talk quite well. Bugs have benefits, and no, I'm not trying to jest with this, because I insist, if you look at a list of the statistics, it's all about locusts, and no, we are no jokers, but seriously, locusts are certainly a more sustainable way forwards. Compared to that Angus beef in your burgers, they'll leave more grain for the worse off among us. Locusts are 60% protein and lean like baked beans or chicken. But in Thailand, it's insects that make the kids beam, and the kernel ain't the only cause of good finger licking. They taste nutty, like cashews, and in fact, they go pretty well in a patty or a butty. We cooked them up in Manchester, made a Thai green curry, and we've got to get that to market in a hurry, according to an enthusiastic man from Berry. 
Now, onto the subject of palate. Let's face it, it's just lately that lobster was good enough for a palace. And truly, believe me, it is no fallacy that locusts are as good as those shrimps from the sea. So, in conclusion, to dispel the illusion, insects are tasty, not horrible or gruesome. So once you've removed the heads, wings and legs, they look less like bugs, but like langoustas instead. And when it comes to making the world well fed, we could do worse than to eat locusts alongside our rice, corn and bread. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.